Good morning, everyone. I will ask everyone to take their seats. Welcome. We have a few more coming in. Good morning. My name is Heather Conley. I'm director and senior fellow of uh, the Europe program here at CSIS. And on behalf of my colleagues, Scott Miller, who chairs our international business program, and Jim Lewis, who directs our strategic technology program, welcome to the second installment in a series that CSIS is hosting, a roundtable series on digital trade in the international economy. Uh, in January of this year, we held our first discussion in this series that brought uh, Meredith Broadbent, uh, uh, a commissioner in the International Trade Commission, to give us the landscape uh, and, uh, and to release a recent report by the ITC on the scope and scale of the digital economy. And we brought uh, some colleagues from, uh, some congressional staff colleagues to help us understand this growing impact of, of digital trade on the US economy and its international implications. So as we try to understand the dynamics of digital trade policy and that intersection of the global infrastructure as well as national and international trade rules, I'd like to tell you we had the absolute perfect foresight of timing in holding our second uh, roundtable discussion uh, with the, the timing of negotiations here in Washington of the Safe Harbor Agreement. But uh, I'll claim success, we didn't, but we had great timing on our side. And we are delighted to focus uh, our next conversation on the Safe Harbor Agreement. Clearly over the last several days, news coming from both Brussels as well as Washington suggests that differences are being narrowed over the Safe Harbor Agreement, yet some challenges still remain. Exceptions uh, for national security, judicial redress, and of course within the European Union, a one-stop shop question of how, uh, how we can look at, uh, uh, at the Safe Harbor Agreement. I think it's so important, particularly in the transatlantic context, because if we don't get this right, it will be very unlikely that we will get the transatlantic trade and investment partnership right. So the stakes are enormously high. We're so grateful today to be in partnership with the European Union delegation and having this as an EU rendezvous event. And we are so delighted that CSIS has uh, had a fantastic partner in the EU delegation and, and Deputy Head of Delegation Francois Rivasseau has been such a, a great partner and thought leader uh, as we look at uh, the larger transatlantic challenges of data protection, data privacy. And I just like to welcome Francois up uh, to, to say a few opening words, and then we will start this fantastic panel discussion on the future of the Safe Harbor Agreement. Francois, and, and we're, we're telling him he was trying out for the French World Cup team, and he had a small accident on the pitch. That's why we're, uh, he's going to take a slow walk up. So thank you, Francois. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being there. Thank you, Heather, for organizing that in a, such a timely manner. Thank you to CSIS and to Dr. Hamre to uh, uh, help us uh, developing our discussions with you on one issue which uh, is really key today. Uh, when we talk about data protection today, uh, as a European, there are various aspects to that. We have worked on various aspects today. We have in town a negotiation. You are going to, uh, I deliver you the top negotiator, <laughs> which is Mr. Paul Nemitz, who is here. You will be able to discuss the pro and cons and the details of the negotiation and the philosophy behind it. Um, but we have been asked to reflect about the issue data protection or protectionism. Let me tell you two things on this global uh, theme. First of all, it is absolutely sure that there is a strong connection between what we are going to decide in the umbrella agreement on one hand, in the implementation which will reverberate in its turn on what we call the safe harbor agreement, I will elaborate a bit on it uh, just after that, uh, and uh, on the TTIP. There is a strong connection. Uh, let me just re remind you that the safe harbor agreement, I don't detail, you all know what it is, but let me tell you, last figures we have, end of last year, the Safe Harbor Agreement had a membership of 3,246 companies. And you know that till now, 
the US companies are considered as certified as compliant to the safe harbor regulations, which allow uh, US company to store uh, data of EU citizens uh, in the US. Nevertheless, after the uh, crisis uh, created by somebody, somebody help me in the name, I just forgot the name. Uh, well, uh, something we, uh, to see with the weather, bad weather, uh, snow, I think, or something like that. Uh, well, let me tell you that a survey carried out by the Cloud Security Alliance found that 56% of respondents in Europe were hesitant to work with any US-based cloud service provider. Uh, that's the impact in monetary terms of a consumer mistrust. Uh, this revelation will cost to the US cloud computing industry between 22 to 35 billion in lost revenues over the next three years. Lost trust means lost revenues. Uh, and w in this context, what to do? There is indeed uh, uh, a need, if we want to achieve a, tr a meaningful trade agreement between EU and US, there is an absolute need to maintain uh, the possibility of exchange of data without barriers, which would be non-tariff barriers in that case, between the two sides of the Atlantic. And that's why the negotiations we are in are absolutely key. And let me just conclude by telling you a bit how we see it from the European delegation. The European Commission, uh, and the European Union as such, and the member states, have all, we have all welcomed President Obama's remarks and presidential directives on the review of the US intelligence program. We, we are particularly interested in welcoming the willingness of President Obama to extend safeguards currently available to US citizens as regards data collection for national security purposes to non-US citizens. This commitment should now be followed by legislative action, and we have been f impressed by the first draft of Senator Sensenbrenner, we, ex we hope that uh, it will uh, that it will go uh, through uh, and uh, as uh, untouched as possible um, but this is one aspect unilateral commitments administrative commitments are great but it's not enough we have also in the so-called umbrella agreement data privacy protection agreement to 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 translate that appropriately in bilateral commitment between the EU and the US. And the, as I said, if we are not able to conclude the, Obama, the umbrella agreement, don't forget that the European Parliament in its uh, previous composition has already requested on March 12 this year the suspension of the safe harbor agreements, obviously. Uh, it's only a, 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 a parliamentary resolution, something looking a bit like a sense of Congress, not much more. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it put uh, on pressure the Commission uh, because the new Commission, um, maybe you followed a bit the debate which exists in Europe, it's not so easy to, to, to have everybody agreeing about the new Commission, and it's likely that when the Commissioners uh, will uh, present their program and, ha and will be uh, heard and approved by the Parliament, uh, there will be some uh, pressure exerted on them. So that's why the earliest and the better we could conclude this negotiation, the safest for all of us. To conclude, protectionism or data protection, privacy protection, they should not be seen as uh, two, two opposite uh, poles. There's one point which is sure. In Europe, the uh, data protection question is not linked to protectionism, that it, it's, not from a prote it's, not a, a, it's not seen from a protectionist angle, because uh, the heterogeneity of our industries is such that there's no uh, uh, big appetite in the European industry to see uh, the, uh, uh, the cloud separating and the sort of protection between uh, Europe and the US. It is seen from an ethical uh, value and privacy protection point of view almost exclusively. So there's no protectionism, arrière pensée, uh, back thinking in the mind of a European on that. But it can have protectionist, unwilled, unwished, and unforeseen consequences if we are not successful. That's why we are going to uh, put all our efforts, and as Heather said, I'm relatively optimistic on the outcome, but we have not to lose time. That said, thank you once again, Heather. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Francois and uh, Heather. And let me add my welcome. Uh, I'm Scott Miller. I run the International Business Program here at CSIS. And we are delighted you're all here today. We had billed this event as a round table, but we didn't have a big enough table that just everybody can ever sit around. So thank you. Thank you for your interest in this. I apologize for the theater style seating. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, we now get to hear from four genuine experts on this uh, very important subject. Uh, you have their biographical information in front of you, so I won't read it to you, but I will give you the order in which uh, the, the panelists will make opening remarks. And uh, as soon as they finish their comments, we'll turn to you uh, for your questions and engage in a dialogue with the audience. Uh, we're going to hear first from Paul Nemitz, the chief negotiator for the European Union on Safe Harbor Talks. Then from Ted Dean. Ted is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Services. Uh, that, uh, that position has a very broad mandate to improve the competitiveness of the U.S. services sector, and uh, Safe Harbor negotiations fall within Paul's uh, uh, duties. Uh, excuse me, Ted's duties. Then we'll hear from Harriet Pearson. Harriet is a partner at Hogan Lavelle's and the co-chair of the Georgetown University Cybersecurity Law Institute and a longtime expert uh, in uh, privacy matters. And finally, we'll hear from uh, our own Jim Lewis, the director of CSIS's Strategic Technologies Program. With that, Paul, look forward. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I think there cannot be enough transatlantic dialogue on privacy and data protection. It is really <clears throat> one of the defining uh, issues of the future. The way we handle this challenge defines our life and maybe also the life of our children. Let me position uh, this a little bit um, um, in the context of law. Um, my proper official title is Director for Fundamental Rights. I'm responsible for the implementation of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, of which the right to privacy is one right. So the right to privacy, the right to data protection has constitutional status uh, in Europe. And um, that's why we have here uh, a lawyer with uh, an employer which is a justice ministry, so to say, uh, negotiating with uh, a colleague, Ted, from the Commerce Department. Um, and um, so what we lawyers have to learn is the importance of technology and, of course, the important contribution to growth uh, the new technologies make. And we have to understand um, um, what the relationship between privacy and growth is. And I will say something about this in a moment. On the other hand, I think when we're talking across the Atlantic, it's also important that those who have responsibility in the United States um, for commerce and business um, understand that in Europe we're talking about fundamental right, which has, uh, fundamental right which has a history which goes far back before the digital age. The title of today is a polemic provocation. It has filled the room. It has served its purpose. <laughs> and that's why the title was good. Um, but uh, to say that the protection of the freedom of the individual against overreach, first of all by the state. That's where it started. And today, also about uh, the overreach of powerful corporations who know and who can read you as a person, but you cannot read them because you don't know the algorithm. And this applies to Americans as well. And um, the function of uh, Data protection and privacy is therefore to protect the individual in its dignity and its freedom. And um, so yes, it has a protective function, but it has not the function of protectionism. What is the relationship between growth on the one hand and the protection of individual rights on the other? We believe and I think we are joined in this by major U.S. corporations, that there is no contradiction between develop, uh, uh, developing high technology and moving forward into the digital age, into the new business models, into growth and employment, and to make this driver of growth and employment benefit all of us on the one hand, 
and the protection of people, of human beings, in their dignity and freedom on the other hand. Why is there no contradiction? Well, we believe, on the contrary, there is a synergy. There is a synergy between both. And what does this synergy consist of? It consists of the trust which individuals need to have in this new digital world that their personal data and that their lives and their personality are not being misused and abused either by the state or by powerful corporations. And only if this trust is there, people will make good use of these services and only then the economy will thrive and growth will be moving forward in a sustainable way. What we observe is that more and more people start to worry what happens to their data, what happens in the hands of the state, what happens in the hand of economic operators, and this is becoming a growth impediment. And if you want to talk about barriers to trade, and I can develop it later in the discussion between um, Europe and the United States, one of the biggest barriers to trade is the activity of the NSA. Unchecked spying, mass bulk collection of data, is a huge disincentive for Americans to use services coming from Europe. Because if you, for example, simply use an EU email service provider instead of your American service provider, because your email comes from Europe and because it transits through the transatlantic cable, and maybe if it's a modern Swedish service provider who provides encryption for free, then your email will be captured probably by the NSA. But if you as an American stay with a US service provider, hopefully it will not be captured. So when we talk about protectionism here today, we have to look at the whole picture. And we have to look at many American laws, and this is probably the most flagrant example, which are a disincentive for free trade and services across the Atlantic. Now, when uh, Ted and me, when we talk about the safe harbor, uh, we talk about uh, a successful model of free flow of data which has grown from 300 participants to more than 3,000 corporations in the US participating. And the first message to take from that is that everybody who says that American high-tech companies can't operate under EU rules for privacy and data protection is completely wrong. Because the success of the safe harbor, the voluntary signing up of more than 3,000 major corporations to the safe harbor shows American companies happily are able to integrate these rules in their successful business model. So I would say the safe harbor is a success of free flow of data. Basically, through the safe harbor, we grant the same status to American companies operating in the United States in Silicon Valley as is granted to any company within the market in Europe. And I think this is a huge privilege which is extended to the United States and uh, as a counterpart, and that was the original intention of the safe harbor, it is only normal that the protection of the data of Europeans, which is transferred, the personal data of Europeans is transferred to the United States for processing, that then these data are also protected here in the way we Europeans expect because this is the data of our people, which is transferred to the United States for reasons of business efficiency. And um, this original purpose of the safe harbor, when it was concluded, has to be maintained into the future and also under the new conditions of digital age and NSA spying. And that's the challenge we are facing together in our negotiations, and this is where I will end. The original purpose of the safe harbor was to guarantee to Europeans when their data is transferred here a higher level of protection than is available under the normal American law to Americans. 
This purpose of the safe harbor has been put into question by NSA bulk collection. And we have to find a solution to this challenge to the safe harbor. It is not Europe which has challenged the viability and the success of this very successful model of free trade of data. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming and thank you, Paul. It, it, it's a pleasure to be here. It's um, a rare opportunity when I sit on the same side of the table as Paul. So it's, it's, a, it's a view I haven't had before. So I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to be here and happy to have uh, an opportunity to, to have a, what I really think is an important conversation um, and, and talk about the work that, that uh, Paul and I are doing together. Um, let me just say a few words about uh, Safe Harbor and, and why I think it's important. I'll talk a little bit about the progress we've made and then I'm really most interested in the, in the conversation we can have uh, uh, together. You know, the, the, I, I uh, uh, couldn't agree more with um, Paul's comment that it's a, it's a uh, successful model and one that we want to maintain and that's why we're working so hard on this. It's, it's important because it provides, in the first instance, because it provides protections for EU citizens' data, which would be difficult to replicate without it. So that uh, US companies subscribe to certain privacy principles when they join Safe Harbor. They put in place compliance procedures to ensure that they're honoring those uh, privacy principles when they're in the Safe Harbor. And that by making public representations about their uh, participation in Safe Harbor, the Federal Trade Commission is allowed to bring or is, 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 is capable of bringing uh, enforcement actions against companies that violate those principles or don't live up to the commitments they make. And so uh, and I, uh, Commissioner Brill and others at the FTC have spoken publicly about how it, it, their job is easier bringing those enforcement actions to protect EU citizens uh, because uh, uh, the, the program is, is, is in place and operates the way it does. It's also important because although we're having some very difficult conversations, sometimes including Paul and myself, about privacy between the EU and, and Europe, when we get to the end of the, this process and are successful, and I think we will be, and step back from this, I think we'll, we will agree that there are uh, uh, much more that the Euro Europe and the United States have in common when we look in privacy than we do with most countries in the world. Uh, and so it's important that our work together reflects those shared values and that we uh, can, in fact, at the end of this process, uh, have the room to step back and look at what we, we, we have in common on these issues. It's also important because this is a conversation, in my view, between uh, friends and allies who have uh, many other common interests outside of the lanes that we are working in, but also have a very important uh, trading relationship. The United States and, and Europe uh, trade over a trillion dollars a year of goods and services. We have over, uh, or close to, I think the uh, uh, correct phrasing should be, close to $4 trillion of, federal, uh, of uh, foreign direct investment in each other's markets. And so if you look at uh, the affiliate uh, uh, of U.S. and European companies in each other's markets. If you look at, in particular, the services trade, where a lot of data flows back and forth, uh, this is a, a vital economic relationship. And underpinning that economic relationship is the data that flows with goods trade, services trade, and investment. So for all of those reasons, it's very important that we're having this conversation together today, and I hope we can have more public opportunities like this, but also why Paul, the work that Paul and I are doing, I think is important that we, we, we come to the end of this. Um, given that importance, uh, let me just say a few words at the, about the approach that we're trying to take uh, uh, in the, our work at the Commerce Department. Um, and you know, the, the commission has a, has a public document uh, with their 13 recommendations about Safe Harbor. We've now been in very intensive consultation with Paul and his team, but we, ha we don't have a, a public statement. So let me say just a few words about uh, the approach that we're taking. The, the first comment I would make, I did a similar roundtable uh, in Brussels a little while ago, and I was, I was uh, introduced sort of with the same job title that, that Paul was here as the, as the chief negotiator on Safe Harbor. And I would draw one important distinction, and that is that uh, I view my job as the chief administrator of this program. My office actually administers the program, and so these over 3,000 companies that are in Safe Harbor certified uh, to our office at the Commerce Department, and we process those applications to be part of uh, Safe Harbor. And so we have a very, very strong interest in our work in making sure that at the, the end of this, we come to something that works 
that we can implement, that we can, uh, that we can act on, um, that it serves the purpose of allowing uh, uh, data flows that comply with the EU data protection uh, directive, that it serves its purpose of uh, protecting the privacy of EU citizens, um, and that in, in doing those things, and we gotta get that right first, but in doing those things, it facilitates the trade relationship between the United States and Europe. Um, given that, the approach that we've tried to take in, in our, in our uh, uh, meetings with Paul and his, his colleagues is not as what the, I mean, one, one approach to this would have been sort of trade negotiation style, no offense to my friends at uh, USTR, but trade negotiation style, what's the very least I can get by to, to, to get to the end of this process? And I think what we've, tr we've tried to do um, is uh, uh, look at what is the most we can do within our resources, um, our uh, statutory constraints to address the concerns that the EU have raised. And I think the fact that, that Paul and I are, are here together is a sign that uh, 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 my respect for him and uh, the work that uh, DG Justice is doing on this issue, but, but hopefully also I think they've, they've recognized uh, the effort that we're putting into this work to make sure that we come out um, at, a, at, a, at a good place at the end of this process. Um, and I think we've, we've made tremendous progress. We can talk in more, a little more detail um, about uh, that as we go and, and, and uh, where we are. I think we uh, appreciate the comments from uh, Vice President Redding on, on Friday about the, the progress that we have already made um, in any uh, negotiation. Uh, sometimes the, the uh, tough issues are dealt with last and still, we're still working on some tough issues. Um, but, I, but I remain very optimistic that we, we get to a good place at the end of this. Let me, let me close, because I am more interested in the discussion here, by just making a couple of, sort of stepping back from Safe Harbor and making a couple of comments about the larger privacy conversation that's happening uh, between the United States uh, and Europe now. Um, I, I, I've read things in uh, Europe or, or heard things in Europe which I think uh, t uh, to, to an American ear might have sounded like, um, uh, you know, we get privacy and you don't. Um, and to be honest, I've heard things said in, in this town in Washington uh, that I think to a European ear probably sounded like we innovate and you don't, or they sounded like we live in a dangerous world and you don't quite get that. Um, and I think none of those characters about views in the United States or views in Europe uh, do justice to uh, uh, the views of either government, uh, the, the uh, uh, debate that is going on about uh, these issues in, in, either, in either country. And, and, but I think those characters, and this is why this kind of forum is so valuable, those characters put us at some risk of talking past each other. And so let me just mention very, very quickly three places where I think we can uh, avoid talking past each other. Um, the first is, as a, as a basis for this, is the uh, uh, big data report that was, um, uh, uh, came out just a few weeks ago that is the result of the uh, review that John Podesta led. And I think if a, a European audience reading that report very carefully um, would probably frankly find some things that they might not completely agree with. Um, but I think it, they, they would also look at that as a very thoughtful effort to deal with some tough issues um, and then uh, a, a basis for a very full discussion of, of, of pathways forward as we look at big data. And, and I know there's work going on at the European Commission on exactly these issues. And so it's my hope that we can sit down with the outcome of that work and the big data report and, and, and look very closely at, at, at some of these tough issues. Another area I'll mention, um, uh, my office uh, is also outside of Safe Harbor, uh, very involved in these issues in an APEC context and has worked on a system called cross-border privacy rules. And we, a couple of months ago, um, announced with <coughs> the Article 29 Working Party, the Organization of Data Protection Authorities in Europe, a referential comparing the APEC uh, cross-border privacy rules and binding corporate rules in Europe. And so we've sat down and said, well, what do our systems have in common and how are they different? And that's, that's a work stream that continues and, again, an area where we can sort of isolate what are some of those concrete differences. And the last area, which I think is a good base for this discussion, is exactly the work that, that Paul and I are doing, where we're uh, uh, working through, yes, what are some difficult issues, but <clears throat> to Paul's point, taking something that we do think is a successful model and looking at um, how can we do 
Uh, how can we ensure that it, it, it continues to serve its purpose in the, perp uh, in the future? And how can it uh, serve its purpose in terms of uh, where there are differences in privacy regimes in the United States and Europe? How do we bridge that and ensure that there's protection for you citizen data that comes here, um, but also that we do facilitate the trade that, that, that relies on safe harbor? But so much to talk about on these issues, but perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you, Ted. Harriet? Thank you, and good morning. Um, I think my role on the panel today is partly historian, since uh, maybe I am the person on the panel that actually was um, somewhat involved and uh, participating at, from the business community perspective during the negotiation of Safe Harbor 1.0, I'll call it, back in 1999-2000, and also um, voice of and view of uh, practical implementation issues and practical impact of these issues on the functioning of, of commerce and business. And um, I'll, I'll take those two roles and, and address a couple of points in turn and then um, look also forward to the, to the discussion. And um, I think the, uh, the discourse so far has been uh, very, very heartening um, because at the, at the foundation of this, the motivations behind uh, the current safe harbor discussions and the prior ones, I think, are rooted in the tradition that both of the jurisdictions involved have a lot in common in terms of the values and in terms of the approach to data privacy. Um, there is a, a lot of uh, commonality, and the motivations today are similar to what were in place um, 10, 14 years ago um, around uh, facilitating transfer and uh, access to data, but doing so in a respectful way of both, um, both countries, both, both jurisdictions. Um, so in terms of the, the history, um, it's, it's hard to um, kind of uh, overstate the difference 14 years can make in terms of the technologies. Uh, in the year 2000, um, think about it, the internet obviously was there, the web was there, but in terms of calling this Safe Harbor 1.0, the early sketches of what were to be the social, um, social communication, social computing, uh, mobile computing, weren't even there. And, and the simple structure of Web uh, 1.0 and Safe Harbor 1.0, um, I think says that uh, there are some opportunities to increase uh, the, 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 the Safe Harbor program and enhance it. So it's, uh, it's meaningful that we have the discussions underway right now. Practical impact for the last 10 years, uh, it's true, the program has grown from three th around 300 to over 3,000. And not a day passes at this point in um, my uh, practice where I don't get a call from a company asking about um, how do we enroll in Safe Harbor, what are the steps, and oh, by the way, is it going to be there in a few years? That is a question that is absolutely there. And um, the companies that we've worked with, and I think from a business community perspective overall, the answer has to be yes. The answer must be yes. Um, it is an exceedingly important mechanism for the transfer and access of data. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, and I think, Paul, you mentioned the role of large corporations. And I think the um, very important point to keep in mind is that many, many, many of the organizations who are availing themselves and registering with the Safe Harbor program are actually quite small companies. And the role of Safe Harbor as a, as a practical mechanism to facilitate the accountable transfer and access to personal data across borders between the EU and the US is essential. The process has been administered in a very good way here in the United States. It's a simple process, but it's also quite a visible one. There's a saying in the uh, saying about sunlight being a good disinfectant, the sunlight of, of enrolling yourself. Um, I will tell you that the um, discussions that I've had with companies before they sign their names, uh, somebody actually has to sign a name and file publicly. Um, it's a very serious step. People take it very seriously. And um, in the main, that is part of, I think, the success of the program. And the viability of it for smaller companies is a particularly important piece. Um, the fact that the, the principles in the safe harbor are very similar to, or are essentially, the fair information practice principles, which underlie all of the major privacy laws in the world, has also been very helpful because it creates um, a way of having a common language, so to speak, around privacy compliance. And so the companies that enroll in safe harbor are also uh, perhaps exploring the APEC cross-border privacy rules. They certainly are working on domestic compliance with laws in Europe, and they're working on domestic compliance with laws in the United States, all based pretty much on the same language. So it's also been a very practical mechanism going forward. 
now that we are at a position of um, perhaps looking at Safe Harbor 2.0, depending on the outcome of the discussions here, um, the path forward, I think, is a vital one. And I would offer a couple of, of thoughts about going forward um, as assuming success here. Um, so uh, first, I think we will continue, and it, I think from a business community perspective, it's essential to continue having a similar um, similar view and reflecting the commonality that exists between the EU and the U.S. systems. Uh, having practiced privacy law now since 1995, um, and uh, so have, have seen the development of the directive and the implementation and the transposition of the directive and now the regulation proposal, um, the commonalities are um, much, much more than the differences. The difference in the implementation, of course, is there, and, and obviously there are differences, but having that continue um, in, a, in a matter of uh, comedy is, is important. Um, Paul, you mentioned the importance of trust. Uh, in the private sector, there is an intense focus on the trust building aspects of use of the safe harbor mechanism going forward and currently, and it is one of the tools that companies do use to signal to their constituents, external as well as internal to their own people, that they have a program in place that they take data, privacy data protection very seriously. So it is uh, going to be continued to be used in that way, I believe, going forward. Now, are there practical enhancements possible? Are there ways to make the program more evident, more robust, uh, in terms of having uh, information about the enrollees? available, um, the process available to European citizens, for example, how to access it, uh, to have more disclosures potentially in the pri uh, safe harbor privacy policies. Those are all potentially open questions and uh, useful in enhancements, and I am um, encouraged to hear that there's a fair amount of consensus on um, some aspects of those being incorporated and um, essentially leading to what I think is the biggest and most important objective of, of the business community on both sides of the Atlantic, because I think we should remember that it's not only U.S.-based companies who use the safe harbor, it's also European-based companies who have operations in both the U.S. and the EU that use the safe harbor. They're all united, in my view and my experience, in the desire for a predictable, sustainable mechanism where you don't have to ask every now and then uh, is this going to still be here? So the permanence of the mechanism, the permanence of having an interoperable approach to uh, data sharing amongst and between allies who have a common philosophy and a common grounding in the value of privacy is essential. And uh, we're heartened to hear the uh, progress and the uh, good spirit with which these discussions are being held. Thank you, Harriet. Jim. Great, thanks. It's always uh, good to be last. So I'm gonna be brief, or brief for me at least. And if Harriet was practical, I guess I'll be the opposite, which is uh, impractical, which I guess is uh, perhaps a, a role for a think tank. <clears throat> so first, a, a little bit of a gloss on the history that Harriet gave you. Um, the internet was designed on assumptions that there would be sort of a single global set of values and that these values would resemble to a fair extent the values of uh, of the United States and then particularly of the of the you know California environment. So that's kind of built into the technology, right? The thing that's been built out of the technology is privacy. So you don't have any privacy on the internet. And if you learned anything from Snowden, that's what you should have learned, right? Um, the question is, and we can talk about that more if you want. See, whenever I make fun of NSA, this happens. <laughs> um, it used to be when I made fun of China, and so, I don't know. I don't know, sports fans. Um, it's, it's difficult to explain. I think people are just beginning to realize the extent to which the business model of the internet depends on advertising and depends on uh, harvesting your personal data and using that to drive revenue. If you dry up that stream, the internet will look very different and it might look more like uh, uh, Minitel than what we have now. So some difficult business issues here, right? Um, one of the things I ask though is can we build privacy back in? And I think the answer is yes, but it will be difficult. And at first blush, the regulations we're thinking about now may not achieve that goal. We're having fun, we're about to start a project with uh, Sherry McGuire's out there in the audience, but. We're about to start a project on the Internet of Things, and so one of the questions we're asking is, when your refrigerator 
connects to the internet under uh, European policy, does it have to notify you, obtain your consent to, to use a cookie, right? The world is going to change very dynamically. Many, many things will be connected. And one of the problems we've seen in the past is that regulations don't necessarily have the flexibility to accommodate that change. This will affect European companies, as you heard, as much as American companies, because they will be the ones providing the industrial internet, the internet of things, the consumer internet. So this is not a purely one-way problem. It's a transatlantic problem, right? Um, the US and Europe do share values, and that sometimes gets uh, hidden in this debate, which can be a little noisy. But I'm not sure our, our values are perfectly congruent when it comes to privacy. And the example for me that best showed that was the decision by the European Court of Justice on the right to be forgotten. A simple Anglo-Saxon term for that would be censorship, right? That was a very shocking decision that an individual can go and ask for portions of a public record to be erased. Um, that indicates we don't see eye to eye on some things. I have a larger question about privacy, and we don't have to talk about that now, and privacy is a fundamental right. I think we have taken this as sort of a given, and it deserves some examination. It may be more of a derived right than a fundamental right, but that's a, that's a larger discussion. The debate here over um, Safe Harbor and the Snowden revelations is part of a larger debate that fits into the fact that nations having come to terms with the internet and with the global cyberspace are extending sovereign control into it, right? So we see this, the European Court of Justice ruling was one example of that, but you can see it in India, you can see it in China, you can see it in Turkey. Um, nations ask, why don't my rules apply to my networks? And the answer is, well, of course they do, right? The issue is the tension between um, sovereignty and the extension of sovereignty and extraterritoriality, right? This is a debate even within the EU, right? So you have rules, they apply to your networks, but you also, given how the internet works, you want them to apply to those who are not otherwise subject to your law, right? You want extraterritorial reach, and we're having a hard time coming to grips with that issue, but how we resolve this will reshape the politics of the internet and how you use it. Uh, we have just touched briefly on, on espionage and NSA. It's come up a couple times. I do think Americans underestimate the uh, effect of this in Europe, but I think Europeans aren't entirely um, um, honest in their own discussion. Uh, again, a separate issue, perhaps. The dilemma here is that in intelligence and espionage are not necessarily areas of competency for the EU. So it's very difficult to see how you would get an agreement Putting aside the fact there is no international law on espionage because nations don't want it. They don't want agreements on this. Um, if this is going to be a hurdle, it will be a major hurdle and one that we probably want to back away from and quietly slip under the rug again, noting that um, there are things that need to change. For me, the larger problem is ultimately, and this applies to both the internet governance, uh, cybersecurity, perhaps to the privacy issues, how do we define responsible state behavior in cyberspace? And for me, a good definition of this, which we don't have, would be one that caught both NSA and the PLA, right? We don't know what that looks like yet, but I think it's possible to come to this. Uh, if you look at the work on Safe Harbor, we should all be relatively pleased. If you looked at the prognosis uh, a while ago, it was very grim. And the negotiators or the administrators have made a tremendous strides. So I'm very optimistic that we can find a pragmatic solution uh, in the near term. But that won't necessarily fix the long-term problems which will keep coming up. And I think uh, a good way to think about this is a good evolution would emphasize the shared political values between Europe and the United States, uh, noting that privacy might not be one of them entirely. And it would emphasize a way to rebuild trust uh, really on both sides of the Atlantic. There's been damage on both sides. That doesn't always come out. So I think a near-term pragmatic solution and a longer-term discussion to get us to a, a new way to think about how we will deal with this transnational phenomenon, the internet, in a way that preserves the rights of our citizens and allows states to exercise their responsibilities to protect their citizens. 
Why don't I stop there? That was inflammatory, so, uh, but intentionally. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jim. <laughs> Last speaker. Very, very helpful uh, intervention, and, and certainly there are, what's interesting to me is there are different kinds of disclosure that get treated differently. Uh, everyone who operates in the internet, most, most firms at least, seek desperately to avoid inadvertent disclosure of information. Uh, and, and you saw what happened to the CEO of Target, okay, and some of the, 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 the security uh, uh, efforts that are made on inadver reducing inadvertent disclosure are very large. And there's this large area of voluntary disclosure between the consumer and the company, which is really the subject of safe harbor and, as I think Harriet uh, correctly illustrated, a point of great sort of practical commonality of interest. And a lot goes on. What, G what G Where Jim ended was on what I would characterize as mandatory disclosure, where governments t require information to be disclosed to them. And that is... That is a transnational problem. It is those kinds of problems are typically solved with laws and treaties, but the the it's the the work is incomplete and subject to very rapid technological change, uh, as the panelists also pointed out. So, helpful discussion. I'd like to open it up to our very knowledgeable audience uh, with uh, three reminders as we start the questioning. First, wait for the microphone. We're, we are we have the. Our, we webcast this event and uh, will be taped, so no one will hear your question out there in cyberspace if you don't wait for the microphone. Second, uh, introduce yourself and your organization, and if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, make that known up front. And third, make sure your question is actually in the form of a question. No statements, please. So, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Ben Hancock from Inside US Trade. Thanks very much for having this panel. Uh, a question first to the negotiators. Uh, Mr. Dean, you talked a little bit about the progress you said you were making this week. Can you walk us through a little bit of that? Um, you know, map out some of the areas where you're finding, you know, uh, consensus with uh, Mr. Nemitz here. Um, also, a question for Mr. Nemitz as well. You talked about the challenges that the NSA revelations have had for Safe Harbor, or posed for Safe Harbor. But out of the recommendations that the commission put forward, only two of them addressed national security exception, and none of them were binding uh, recommendations or recommendations for, for new binding rules. So how do you see this process as in any way addressing or fixing uh, some of the problems that the NSA revelations revealed? Thank you. Ah, Ted, go ahead. please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> on uh, uh, the recommendations, one has to recall that we're not talking here about a bilateral agreement under international law, but we're talking, uh, when we talk about the safe harbor, uh, about a commission decision recognizing the commitments which the U.S. has put on the table. So basically, when the commission said it's a recommendation, well, it's a recommendation to itself and thus sets out our line of thinking so that the U.S. government, the European Parliament, and member states know what our intentions are. So basically, you know, this is, I think, also against what Ted and me are working now. Um, it is true that out of the 13 recommendations, only two concern uh, the issue of national security. One is the recommendation that companies should make transparent to their customers under which laws they are obliged to make information available to governments and which privacy principle, therefore, uh, uh, they may have to set aside. And the other recommendation is that <clears throat> um, government access to uh, uh, data shall only take place when this is, national, uh, when this is necessary and proportional for uh, national security reasons or reasons of, of law enforcement. And. Um, this um, test of necessity and proportionality, to come also to uh, uh, the remark of uh, uh, James on, on the competences, is indeed a matter of European law and the European Commission. And we have no problem with our competences there, because uh, what we are talking about in the safe harbor is not spying in the sense of uh, governments trying to get information from other governments, you know, listening to the uh, telephone of uh, the German Chancellor. That's not what we're talking about. That's not a competence of the European Commission. 
We are talking about mass collection of what any individuals do on the internet. And there we are in the area of privacy protection and data protection, which is uh, uh, a fully a competence of the European Union. And the Court of Justice has said, even to our own member states, that if a member state invokes national security grounds to do something, then the member state must demonstrate to the judge that what it does is necessary and proportional for uh, the purpose of national security. And uh, so um, when we are talking here to the United States, what uh, on this point uh, the talks need to come to is a concretization of what this means, necessary and proportional, in relation to the data transmitted uh, 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 over the safe harbor. So we need a concretization. And, uh, um, you know, this is uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, 50% of the result. It's one of 13 recommendations, but it's the big elephant in the room. Let's be very clear about it. And, um, you know, I hear we, on both sides, we want the safe harbor. It's commercially very important. Well, you know, the U.S. government has, made, has to make up their mind of what's important. And this is very much alike to the discussion which you have inside the United States. You know, I see American companies taking very clear position on what would be necessary to regain trust in the internet also in the domestic debate. And I'm heartened by that. And, uh, you know, uh, there is an element of this debate which pertains also to Europeans. Because, uh, um, you know, Europeans have the same right to protection and the same right to trust in the internet um, as others. And so basically what we are now seeing is a reform process in the United States, which is very much focused on, you know, domestically. And uh, the safe harbor is the opportunity to fulfill the promises and the perspective set out by the president in his speech on 17th of January and in the policy directive number 28, which says we will extend protection also to non-Americans. And here we have an opportunity to concretize this announcement and uh, to come to real impacts of protection also for Europeans when their data is transferred uh, uh, over the safe harbor. Let me say um, a word about, uh, you know, uh, the Google judgment. I mean, I would say, first of all, the Google judgment has to be read together with the other big judgment on um, the digital, uh, which is on data retention. And here you can see, if you read these two judgments together of the European Court of Justice, that it's not correct to put Europe into the same sentence with India and China and Russia and those who terribly want to take away the freedom from the internet. But I would put to you the contrary thesis. The European Court of Justice has taken the leadership in the judicial structuring of the challenging of the future of the digital with one judgment which rejects what American citizens are now subject to and will be in the future, namely retention of telephony metadata. What you are discussing in the United States now as the great progress of liberty, which is to move the retention from the NSA to private companies in the judgment on data retention by the European Court of Justice has been declared illegal under European laws. So please don't put us in the same sentence with India, China, and Russia when it comes to freedom. This judgment could be great inspiration for Americans to understand what freedom is about. In Europe, the freedom now is not to have European law, which has basically unlimited data retention on telephony data. Read it and be inspired for your domestic debate. So here's one judgment limiting what the state can do. And there's another judgment which rebalances the situation on the internet, that's the Google judgment, in a way which is totally normal and fully in line with a long line of jurisprudence also on television and newspapers and so on. There is no right of a television station to put a camera up and, you know, just film your garden 24 hours a day, you know, just see what's going on. No. You have a protected space of privacy. And these basic principles of privacy protection somehow have to be translated also into the digital age. 
And the court has very, very clearly said that the right to privacy must be balanced with the right to information. And it is not correct what James said, that records have to be erased. According to this judgment, links have to be erased on Google. But that doesn't mean that the record is erased, nor does it mean that the information cannot at all be found on the internet. It's a delicate balance, but this delicate balance and this work on this del delicate balance is necessary for a free society. Because, you know, to put the question even bigger than uh, uh, James has put it, the question we are facing in the digital age is whether technology rules alone or whether human beings with their freedom and, uh, and dignity are still respected as individuals. That is the big question we are facing, and that is also the balancing exercise we have to do when we are facing the potential of technologies, namely Google makes everything transparent, allows profiling of individuals big time based on public sources. And on the other hand, we have an individual which is completely stripped of any individuality and freedom and dignity, because advertising is the money source of the internet. I mean, you know, thanks for the honesty at least. Well, you know, this is something European law doesn't allow, and honestly, I've studied in the United States with a Fulbright scholarship. I think Americans also don't want it. Americans also want individual freedom, and if you look at the opinion polls about the worries of people, they're not very different. We share the same values, it's true. And also the empirics are the same. American people also don't want to be stripped totally of any right to privacy protection and protection of personal data and want to be profiled all the time, big time, by data dealers, address dealers, and so on. Ted, would you, would you like to... Uh well, either respond sure. to Paul or the original sure. question, I, I, and I'll I'm give just, Jim I'm, a chance to respond. We, we I, know I, at least one person agrees with you, so <laughs> that's... Uh, uh, I, I am, uh, I'm so happy James is here because I spent so much time debating with Paul that now there's someone else that can come in and <laughs> debate, with, debate with Paul. So no, this is great. I mean, I think your question was about exactly kind of where we are in the, in the uh, process and the progress we made. And perhaps my shortest answer would be no, I don't want to go in exactly that. I'm getting along so well with Paul that I don't want to <laughs> sort of uh, uh, negotiate in, in public on this. But, but what I would say in sort of going back to my uh, uh, initial comments on this is, um, you know, I view what we have uh, uh, come together on on um, the first 11 recommendations on Safe Harbor uh, as not uh, concessions we have made, um, but rather improvements on the program that we uh, are, were able to come together and say, yes, these are improvements on the program. And so some of those have been simply endorsing recommendations that the commission has made where we thought they, they, were, they, they made good sense. Some of them have been where there are some challenging issues as we looked at the recommendation, coming up with creative ways to, uh, to address the concern if, if, if the recommendation itself was challenging. And in the course of this process, we've uh, looked at what are uh, other things we can do beyond the 13 recommendations that we think would uh, make this, this work in the, long, in the long term. I think it's important as we, as we talk about Safe Harbor, I, I don't want, um, in, in the history of this program, which now is you know 14, 15 years, um, to people to, for, to leave people with the impression that somehow uh, this is a a you know loophole in EU law that the U.S. discovered. Um, that Safe Harbor operates the way it does because after what I, I believe, when, and Harriet would know better than uh, remember than I, you know, multi-year negotiation, we agreed that this is the way it would operate. Now it's it's certainly true that a program that had a few dozen companies in the first years, um, a program that uh, uh, in a very different technological environment, a program with when very business, different business models were used, um, this is a good time to look at this. But again, I'm not, I, I don't view the work that the Commerce Department is doing this as negotiating over concessions, but rather how do we get this right to serve the purposes and where we're, we, we, you know, we started. If this is a successful model that is important, how do we, how do we make sure we deliver on that? Um, 
uh, it, it may come as a, as a great shock to uh, some of you in the audience, but it will not be uh, my office at the uh, Commerce Department, which resolves on its own uh, Recommendation 13. Um, but as I sit here representing the U.S. government, I do feel some obligation to talk about as, as what uh, Paul has described as the, as the elephant in the room. Um, I think one of the, the one of the we're, we're working hard on this, but one of the, the key points I would make uh, uh, describing what's out there in, in, in public is that the European Commission's report on Safe Harbor came out in November. Um, there were, through the course of the fall, uh, uh, intensive consultations between the United States and Europe on some of these issues. Um, in January, uh, uh, on January 17th, the President uh, gave a speech on signals intelligence and really they released uh, PPD 28 uh, looking at these issues. And one of the points I've made when I've spoken about this in, in Europe is if you go back and read that speech, a, a very significant portion of the speech actually addresses these international issues. And I was trying to think of an other, uh, some other policy debate where there are significant domestic uh, 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 debate in play um, where a similar high percentage of the sort of public speech of the President of the United States was also about the concerns of folks internationally. And I, and I don't think, um, I, I think it's worth uh, uh, going back and looking at that and recognizing just how much work went into that part of the speech, that, that, that uh, just how much uh, 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 was, was included that addressed these issues, and looking at, at the PPD. And so since the Commission's report, um, PPD 28, uh, uh, made announcements about particular things that changed immediately and then set in place several processes that continue uh, now. And so one milestone that we've already had uh, is uh, uh, the pedestrian review on big data, which had certain additional uh, policy recommendations to the president. Um, and then the PPD 28 also uh, tasked the intelligence community with additional work that would be done over 180 day period. So um, we still have work to do and we're still working at it. Um, but outside of the work we're doing in the safe harbor context, uh, the broader context is, I think, changed through, through, through that work. And so I want to make um, uh, 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 that point clearly as well. Um, but these are, uh, these are lively issues. And I think you know, the, the uh, other key point I would make is um, I think we get to a, a good outcome at the end of this discussion on safe harbor. But we need to have a lot more of this kind of forum here in the United States and in Europe with folks from USG and from uh, European Union uh, talking about exactly this kind of issue because, um, you know, listen, we don't need to, to James's point, we don't need perfect congruence on, on how we think about these issues. And in fact, that's exactly the purpose of Safe Harbor is to take a place where we don't have perfect congruence and find a way to have a bridge. But to create those bridges and make it work, you have to have a pretty open and honest conversation about how you're thinking about these issues, and that's why I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity and the conversations I've had with Paul and for and this this meeting today. Thanks, Jim. You want to comment or we'll sure? Move just on. very quickly. I mean, remember this is a discussion among friends, and so I'm very optimistic that uh, we will get to a good outcome both in the near term on safe harbor and in the long term. Uh, in the larger issues that come before us because we, we do share values, we do share common cultures. Uh, the alternatives perhaps aren't as nice. I mean, some may wish to, I read that Marie Le Pen wishes to partner with Vladimir Putin. Have fun, lady. Um, so at the end of the day, we are, we are partners naturally, but there's a few points to bear in mind. Um, mass collection was done for counterterrorism purposes and it was often done in cooperation with European services. That the European public did not know this is more a comment on the weakness of oversight in the in European countries rather than the nature of the program itself. And so one thing I would encourage our European colleagues to do is think about US style oversight of intelligence agencies. It should not be three people and a dog who know what your intelligence agency is doing. Um, the second issue to think about is, uh, and if you think about European data retention laws, the second issue to think about is there's a discrepancy that's troubling to Americans sometimes between national practice and, and the commission statements, and these don't always align perfectly. I, I would caution that one of the things that got NSA into trouble is everything NSA did was legal, okay? 
totally legal under both U.S. and international law, right? But that was widely perceived as hair splitting. And it's saying that, well, the link is removed, but the document isn't mm, a little too close to um, a little too close to the bone for me to be comfortable with. If you can't find it, if it's hidden, if it's removed, um, that's what we're worried about. So right now, I'd say the U.S. and Europe share values, but not solutions. And so one of the benefits of this larger discussion is perhaps we can move from our shared values to solutions that are at least more compatible uh, and that take into account both the need for privacy, the need for responsible state behavior, but also the need to ensure economic growth and economic activity. This is one of the things that worries me sometimes about uh, heavy-handed regulation. I know that some people find that weird coming from me, but um, it, does, it is a problem. Uh, regulation is essential, I agree. Too much of it, though, uh, kills economies. Yes, sir. Brian Beery, Washington Correspondent, Europolitics. I have just a very specific question to follow up on a comment that Mr. Nimitz made about the difference between this being a bilateral agreement and a decision of the European Commission. Um, could you just explain why that point is important and what exactly it means? And uh, do you think the Commission can sign off on this uh, agreement without new U.S. legislation specifically dealing with the, the ability of um, the U.S. government to take uh, mass data um, from the Internet? <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, according to our understanding of um, U.S. law, limitations of the activities of the NSA and the other secret services are within the executive domain. So the president can say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Doesn't need a congressional law. Just a parenthesis, I don't want to confuse you, but we have another negotiation going on with the United States on a bilateral agreement under international law for exchange of data in the area of police and judicial cooperation. That's called the umbrella agreement. And there the big issue is equal treatment in judicial protection of Americans in Europe, which already is the case, and Europeans in the US, which is not the case. In that negotiation, we are asking to get equal treatment to have judicial review also for Europeans in the US. This seems to require a law from Congress, but it's a different constellation. In the safe harbor, we believe, but you know, American law question, it's uh, within the executive powers of the president to impose limits. Now, why is uh, the safe harbor a unilateral decision of the commission and not an, uh, an international agreement uh, um, under international law? Because that's what our law foresees. Our law foresees that legally personal data can only be transferred from Europe to a third country if that country grants an adequate level of protection of the personal data. Adequate being, you know, measured on our laws. Whether that is the case or not is decided by the European Commission. And if the Commission decides that uh, there is uh, an adequate level of protection, then the data can be transferred and processed uh, in the other country. The United States has been considered not adequate by the European Commission. That's why the safe harbor negotiations was, were, were started, and the system of the safe harbor is such that those corporations, companies, which self-certify to comply with the privacy principles laid down in the safe harbor, that these companies benefit from a limited adequacy finding, which is the decision of the Commission to recognize the safe harbor system as sufficient protection as far as those companies are concerned. Right. Harry, you may want to uh, clarify additionally. This is a voluntary process from Just the U.S. Just a, a quick view. addition is kind of from a, from a legal perspective. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree from a U.S. law perspective that um, there is power in the executive branch to um, adjust and communicate 
policy that would um, not require uh, legislation and so allow the, um, the discussion to proceed. On the point you just made, uh, Mr. Nimitz, on the, um, on the uh, need for uh, unilateral uh, agreement by the EU, I think it's an important point to note for the future development of sustainable and uh, predictable interoperable agreements on data transfer that um, there are probably other mechanisms and other ways to come to a handshake, so to speak, between the EU and the U.S. on data transfer. So at the moment in the year 2000, there was an opportunity to have an agreement reached the way it was, the way it was structured with a safe harbor. And uh, I think everyone is heartened by the fact that it appears that uh, you know, safe harbor 2.0 is going to emerge pretty much in the same construct. But the um, idea that there's only one way to have that handshake, I think, is something that ought to be examined. Um, there are ways to take the same idea that says, you know, we have a common set of principles, companies would sign up to abide by them, but have that agreement made potentially in a, in a trade agreement, for example, among other kinds of entities is something that is possible. And we ought not to, I think, fall into the trap of if policy was made once in one way, then policy has to be made again the same way. If, if I could add, and I just want to take advantage of a rare opportunity to agree with both of the previous speakers. Um, uh, I, I, I just wanted to be clear that on the, on the question of the adequacy finding, the legal construct, this is not a point of discussion or, or, or uh, uh, disagreement. And in fact, I mean, I direct you to our, on the Commerce Department website, you can easily find the Safe Harbor Framework. And I believe you can actually, I believe there are public documents, which are the letters that were exchanged in 2000 uh, uh, as the, as the uh, framework was uh, uh, put, put in place. Um, but it is a uh, safe harbor rests on this adequacy finding from the uh, uh, European Commission, and so that's the, the legal contract. Likewise, I agree, I agree with Harriet that you know one of the things that uh, about this, I, I as I've said before, do believe we get to a good outcome on this, um, given uh, growth of the program, changes in technologies, changes in business models. I don't think our work ends when we conclude this, and. Um, Again, not looking at what the mechanism is for you know future agreements or future adaptation on this. Again, viewing this as something a program that that my office administers. Um, you know, we need to continue to work very closely with DG Justice on uh, problems as they surface. We need to continue to work, and we're in fact deep in our cooperation with European uh, data protection authorities to make sure that as problems uh, surface, they're they are addressed. Some of the um, recommendations that are in that Commission's report. Um, deal with things like false claims when a company says they're in safe harbor and they are not in fact in safe harbor. Uh, you know, looking at this, we, the, the, our, our primary interest is the um, uh, how you make this work for privacy, but frankly as the administrator of this program, that's just bad for my brand. You know, when, when, a, when a problem surfaces like that, if people can't, how do you in, in, ensure trust? Well, people have to know that when a company, they look at a privacy statement and they see representations about safe harbor, that they know that that, that that company is actually certified at the Department of Commerce, that the uh, Federal Trade Commission has uh, enforcement authority. And so, uh, you know, we have a very strong interest in, and I think we'll have to, to make this work on administrative, continuing this work as, as, as perhaps not quite as intensively as we have over the last few months, but, but continuing to work very, very closely with partners in Europe to make it work. Can I make one, one more practical uh, observation? Is I think um, we've also talked a, a fair amount about the internet and advertising-based business models. And I think it is absolutely essential. I, I made earlier the point that there are a lot of small businesses, smaller sized businesses that are utilizing the safe harbor mechanism. The other point to note is the nature of the data transfers and flows here. I would bet, I don't have a firm statistic, but if you look at the 3,200 companies that are enrolled and the types of data that are being covered here in the safe harbor and that are prospectively will be covered, it's a lot of what? HR information, information that you're using to run your business, data that may absolutely transits perhaps the internet or internet-like systems or networks, but this is not in the main about enabling um, you know, certain business models. It's about enabling all business models, including the operations of organizations that are operating to serve customers across borders, that are you know, do, engaging in trade, and they're engaging in, frankly, the more um, routine type of data transfers that are essential to an international economy. And the, the sooner I think we get that in the lexicon of 
um, how we talk about the safe harbor, uh, the better off we'll be in terms of coming in terms of coming together as allies to create a mechanism that's sustainable that actually supports the real business of business. Excellent just, point about the back office. Numbers. Just Sorry. real quickly on that too, it's this is a point that will probably lead us to agreement because it will affect European companies operating in the U.S. as much as American companies operating in Europe. So when you look at the extensive presence of European firms in the U.S., they'll need to do the HR, the finance, the shipping and data transfers. And this is an area of commonality that I think will help us reach agreement. Thank you. Another question? I don't mean to neglect this side of the room, but you're being quiet. So. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jorge Carrera from the Spanish Embassy, Justice Consul. Uh, concerning uh, uh, equal footing on, on rights, uh, privacy rights protection, uh, and, and concerning John Podesta's report, there is a statement there that more or less says that uh, privacy act rights should be extended to non-US citizens. So I would like to know in which extent this point is in light of your, your negotiation. And as it seems to me, uh, maybe uh, establishing an equal footing in legal terms for non-US citizens would require some uh, legislative action. So uh, is one thing linked to the other? So is it possible to reach, for example, an agreement on, on safe harbor and then waiting for uh, uh, another moment in order to, to, to uh, make, a, I would say, a, a legislative reform in order to, uh, to, to uh, establish a equal footing for uh, Privacy Act protecting, or uh, you will wait until, uh, in case it's necessary, this legislative action is taken. Thank you. Had a thing to come for you. Sure. I mean, on, uh, on the recommendation in the big data report, it relates to administratively how can you, uh, 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 you know, through policy changes, extend, uh, uh, and I can't remember, I don't have the exact language, but it's sort of pri privacy uh, act like, but it's, but it's administrative changes. And so uh, that's a recommendation of the president that is being looked at and work is, is beginning on. Um, it is, uh, uh, I, I think I'll leave to Paul the sort of the um, uh, negotiating position of the EU on this. Um, it is, as, as Paul said earlier, uh, that constellation of issues around the Privacy Act and judicial redress are, are part of uh, the umbrella agreement negotiation and not uh, directly relevant to um, safe harbor. Um, uh, I, I, to your point on how do you sequence and how do you make this work, I think one thing we need to be conscious of is um, there is a cost born uh, both in the United States and in Europe to delays and uncertainty about this. And so one of the reasons we've engaged so intensively and been working so hard on this is because the sooner we get this done, the better for everybody. And I'll give you two sort of concrete examples to make that point. Um, one is uh, sort of at the micro level in my office. Uh, I have folks who are, uh, you know, busily preparing for my meetings with Paul later this week and, and reviewing uh, uh, documents that we're exchanging and things like that. Um, uh, I want them to get done with that process and go out and make these changes. And so at a, at a basic level, to the extent that we've defined improvements in the program, and I think we have, the sooner we get them implemented, the better. Uh, that's sort of at a micro level for me. Um, but more generally, uh, in uncertainty on these issues has cost for business. And there, as I said, cost born in the U.S. and Europe. I think sometimes um, uh, there's a perception that, well, if a, if a uh, uh, U.S. firm in Europe uh, loses some business because of uncertainty in this, or there's a customer uh, of an American company who's worried that their data might be transferred to the United States under safe harbor, and is it a reliable instrument? Will it be around in a few years? Um, well, that's lost business to the American firm. Well, on this, if, if the European firm didn't want to work with the U.S. firm, this doesn't matter. It only matters because there's a European uh, firm on the other side who, you know, looking at the cost and performance of that solution, wants to uh, wants to adopt the the uh, uh, you know work with the U.S. partner. And so uh, there are costs that are borne there. There are costs that would be borne by 
uh, the over 100 uh, European companies that are themselves safe harbor members. So um, how that plays out as we move forward in terms of sequencing, I'm not sure, but that we, we all need to work expeditiously on this um, because we do bear costs for not, not getting it done. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, very quickly, I think um, the U.S. government has for long recognized, and the FTC also says it regularly, that uh, you know, there, there are gaps in U.S. Uh, privacy legislation. President Obama presented his blueprint of a baseline legislation in, uh, in I think, uh, when was it? Uh, 2012. Huh? 2012. 2012. Uh, then the Podesta report also. So I think there is no doubt that the U.S., you know, the government wants to move forward but it's not happening, and I'm sure Harriet can explain the reasons better than I, why not. Um, now, um, what's the relation of this not happening to uh, the safe harbor? It's very simple. When we look at the adequacy of the country, we first look at all their laws and the enforcement system. If the US would have laws and a good enforcement system, uh, then maybe one day uh, we don't need the safe harbor anymore because maybe one day we come to adequacy for the U.S. as a whole. But this requires legislation and independent authorities which enforce this legislation. And let me also say very clearly here, because I hear, you know, we have to respect the values of both sides. There's always, you know, I mean, Herod is a master in, well, you know, let's talk about it in trade agreements. Right. Sorry, Herod, no. <laughs> Uh, we will not negotiate this down. There is no way that privacy standards of the European Union can be negotiated downwards, you know, let's meet in the middle respecting both parties, like in a trade agreement you do. Why? Because they are of constitutional requirements. And I also would predict for you, outside the law, I'm not talking now as a lawyer, for privacy, there's only one way from now on and this is true for the United States, for Silicon Valley, and for Europe, and for the rest of the world, which is more protection, more of it, not less. You see, this is one of those invisible threats which people only realize about after a number of incidents and so on. It's like atomic power, or Julie Brill says it's like smoking, I say it's like atomic power. In both cases, invisible threats. We don't know what's happening to our data. People will learn about it. So the pressure is on to have more protection. And I know those who have advertising revenues and make money by of stripping people of their private life and personal data, you know, they have a problem with it. They stall. They are masters in keeping legislation away. And, you know, some on the podium are grandmasters in this. But um, there is only one way to go. And everybody who has a sustainable business model and wants to make money sustainably is well advised to hear the bells ringing. Because sooner or later, those people who try to make money by screwing individuals, and that's what's happening in the real world, they will not make money anymore. Because the trust issue is in the room. And so there are some businesses which will lose trust and some businesses which will do the right things and they will gain trust. And so from that point of view, privacy is also a business di differentiator and a competitive advantage for Europe. We are doing something good for our businesses because they will be able, European businesses will be able to offer also to Americans certainty that your personal data and your life is not abused for money. Ted, do you want to comment? Uh, uh, I there's, there's, there's a number of very valuable uh, conversations that we're having at once today. So I want to draw uh, one, That's one, way to say it. one, one narrow um, uh, distinction, and that is, and that is that uh, uh, I'll help you, out. you know a, a company, a company that has an advertising-based business model, a company that uses big data, a company that uses these these business models that we're having as parts of these conversations, can. Uh, uh, subscribe to the principles that are in safe harbor. They can have compliance procedures which ensure that they honor those procedures. They can have uh, the Federal Trade Commission there as a, as a, the cop on the beat that I think has a great deal of, of credibility and, and respect in Europe, that when they violate those procedures, they could be subject to very significant 
uh, enforcement actions, as has in fact happened with some of these very uh, uh, companies, so that the cop on the beat has uh, uh, made arrests, so to speak. Um, uh, and so the, the, there's a valuable conversation to have about, and, and, and the pedestrian report uh, talks about this, about uh, online advertising, business models, about some of these issues. Um, that is not, uh, we don't need to resolve that conversation to come to agreement on how Safe Harbor should operate. Because companies, again, can have follow the noise, notice and choice principles, can uh, uh, comply as we've agreed and operated for 15 years with the European Commission um, on their, uh, 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 how those principles which align with European law and, and continue with their businesses. So um, uh, CSIS will not go out of business uh, continuing to host uh, lively discussions on some of these topics. <laughs> But we can still finish Safe Harbor before those, those conversations are concluded. So. That's right. Last three points? Yes. Could I, one, uh, I have to address this. Um, there are privacy laws in the United States. And so this is a very informed audience, but just for the record, because it was said, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of privacy laws and causes of action out there, and it keeps uh, many, many lawyers very busy helping organizations do the right thing with respect to compliance, but then also do more in terms of maintaining trust. That's one point. Second is, it's important, I think, pull back all the way. Why are we having this discussion in the first place? We are living in historic times, and I think you can absolutely wax eloquent about the challenge here, but I think if you pull back even farther, say we are living in historic times in terms of the rapidity with which technology innovations are embedding themselves in our daily lives and in our businesses and in how we actually operate the world. And so in that kind of environment, of course we're gonna have conversations and debates about fundamental important issues like privacy and cybersecurity and all the other issues. And as we have those debates, it is important to take a look at the dynamic governmental um, systems that exist and see how well they're responding to those changes. And I would put the U.S. system at a pretty equal, if not, you know, equal footing at least in terms of how dynamic and how self um, self-exploratory uh, it is in terms of saying, what are the right answers? How do we go move forward? And it's not easy to pass legislation. You don't want to pass legislation every few years on these issues. We end up having a, many, many statutes. You want to be thoughtful about it. And I think that's the way the system is working, and it has worked in the last uh, number of decades, and it will continue to work. Thank you, Harriet. I actually think that